Okay, so we uh, find ourselves up in the yurt again, Jordan. Yeah, now we're actually in the yurt. Now we're officially in the yurt. Yeah. And it's uh, full of uh, nature. <laughs> Creatures in the wall. And also a lot of stillness. It's a pretty sacred space up here, pretty pretty uh, special energy in, in here. You also feel that? No, not really this time. Last time I did. Okay, it's interesting. Maybe it was to do with like the uh, atmosphere or something. Awesome. So actually just before we uh, recorded this podcast, we were, um, we're doing a little meditation together, weren't we, Tobin? Yeah, we were. We were, we we're just talking about how you get visuals when we meditate or when you meditate sometimes and I don't get any visuals and people are different like that. Yeah. Some people go to all kinds of places and experience all kinds of things and other people like me don't experience anything at all. Hmm. <clears throat> and either way is okay. You know, meditation yeah. is not something that like you do be to get a, uh, a certain visual kind of uh, experience of any kind. I mean, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. If you, it doesn't happen. <laughs> so it's like, and that's, that's very, it's very okay. It's not the, uh, n by no means the, uh, the, uh, the goal of meditation. What is the goal of meditation? What's your, you meditate, what is, what is your goal with your meditation? Why did you when you when you started doing it? Why did you start doing it? What kind of what came out of it? Did like did the stuff come out of it that you thought would, or what was what was it like for you? Why did you originally start? You can take us on a little tour. A little tour. Yeah. How did it start? Uh, how far back do you want to go in the tour? Well, just a a rough sum up of the the early times and just what you find important <laughs> in your journey okay up until now with meditation so uh meditation has been a part of my life the last 15 years you can say oh same as me more or less yeah and there's been times i mean i got 16 but you know you'll catch up kiddo <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll never catch up if you keep going. <laughs> no. Sorry. Go on, go on. That was... Yeah. No, but um, it's not something I've been like kind of actively doing for 15 years. Where it, And that's where we differ, I guess. It's like, it seems like on your journey, Tobian, that, um, that you've been more consistent with it and it's been more a part of your life. For me, it's been like there's different stages in my life where I've been showing up and meditating more often than not than others and these last six months six eight months maybe even longer now I've been very very consistent and very kind of it's been very important for me to to um to do that but where it all started was actually when I was about 14 or 15 I read a book called the Tibetan book of uh living and dying Oh, right. Yeah. I think it's called by, it's by Rin, Rinpok. Oh, Rinpoche, Rinpoche or whatever. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought so. And there was some meditation guidance in there with a mantra and all this stuff. 
And I was just like, this sounds, this seems pretty interesting. So I literally just read the book and did the meditation. And um, yeah, I was doing it for like a week or something. And there was this moment of when I was sitting there, I was just following the instructions and whatever and it's all that emptiness and things like that and whatever else and it was really interesting what happened was my everything just got really really quiet and yeah my mind was just very very still with thoughts probably not many thoughts actually at that that moment and there was this incredible uh Yeah. There was this, this incredible um, lightness, like they just kind of. So it was, it, was, it was in a room where it was completely, completely black, completely dark, and this just f- like almost like a flash of light just kind of like appeared in, um, and it was it was incredible. Like I, I, I don't know what you would call that or whatever. I mean, looking back on it now, I could call it different things, but. Uh, that for me was such a significant thing in my journey with meditation. That was like, wow, this is there is something there. It's something pretty, pretty special. And um, it was also like a, a feel, maybe a feeling, but it was also just like this, this, uh, yeah, I guess awakening of some some sort, a very little one at that time. But that's how I started this journey of meditation. Mm. And the last six months or eight months has been very very consistent. Um, after going through some challenges here in, yeah, in my re- relationship and in Denmark and stuff, and also um, starting a, a clinic in Aarhus, it's been the, the the two go hand in hand for me, and I see that as like a a way of growth and a way of like um, understanding myself and understanding my own yeah, thoughts and body and feelings. Uh, on a deeper level, and for me, meditation is is a is a way a way into that, because then when I go out of the meditation, that also affects just the interactions with myself and other people. Oh yeah, and that's uh, that's been, yeah, what has come out of some of the things that's come out of that. So, mm. yeah. So. When, when when you started meditating, like, or rather, you came back to it. If you, I just want to say, like, it's the same for me. It's also been on and off. It hasn't been consistent all the time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it also has intensified in the last six months, last uh, one and a half year, really. Uh, really has it has really been intensified for me. Mm. And then it's been going on and off. Uh, I experience what a lot of people do is that you meditate when you suffer and then when you get out of suffering you stop meditating and then you suffer again because you've stopped meditating and so on so <laughs> and then when you're lucky you get to a point where it sounds like maybe you are there now where you where you have a taste for the light and you you actually want to um, you want to go towards consciousness on your own out of a desire yeah. and not so much for utility or out of fear of what happens when you don't. Mm. But you cross that border and you will at some point, if, if you're on a spiritual journey, everything gets much easier. That's when your energy is pulling you upwards automatically. Until that point, you may have to fight for it actually. And you may get this on and off. But there is a point where you start to sort of gravitate or levitate, I would say, I guess, upwards. And at that point, consciousness is pulling you towards it. Whereas before you had to try and pull consciousness towards you. Mm. So when you cross that threshold, things get a lot, a lot easier. When you say a lot easier with showing up <laughs> in meditation or... Yeah, because it's, like, it's kind of like uh, you can kind of compare it to when people have been running for many years at some point, running just becomes a part of... They don't feel right if they don't run, right? Mm. Something's missing. Such a or, crucial part of their... Yeah, they, they come to rely on it. And at some point... Uh, you just get a taste of, you get a taste for the good life, and then it pulls you towards you. And when you get to that point, you're you're very lucky. And then until that point, it can be quite a struggle. Can you tell us a little bit about that good life, that that part of meditation? 
how you've experienced it? Well, I wanted I wanted to hear more about when you when you did meditation when you 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 did it over time and you there were periods when you didn't or whatever, but when you when you returned to it, when you got away from it, you returned to it. What was it that you were? What did it do for you that you needed that made you come back to it? And what was it that that disappeared when you didn't do it? Like what 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 does what has meditation done for you and why have you mm. why have you looked for it? Why do you go to it? And what happens when you don't? <laughs> what happens when I don't uh, meditate? Yeah. I am much more uh I'm, yeah, I'm much more caught up in my um, in my mind, <laughs> reacting from thoughts. So like, just kind of like something comes up, and I just kind of go with that and get very kind of caught up in that. And I still, I still, I mean, I still do from time to time. It's it's not the yeah. that that doesn't happen. It's just that like I'm much more able when I'm meditating, and then come out of the meditation, like just in the daily life and things like that. You could say to be aware of these thoughts and notice them and kind of before they like get hook me and then I'm just like so caught up and I'm, I'm coming from that place or reacting from that place. What happens and if that, you, if you don't meditate for a while, what do you experience of, uh, what, what kind of negatives do you experience? The negatives, I guess for me is really a disconnect from myself and also, uh, Yeah, I would just say like there's a there's a certain element of um, something missing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you there's get some, any something kind of like, uh, yeah? You say. Does anything build up? Is there a build up of like stress or anxiety, or is there anything? Is there anything that uh, for me like it's almost like <clears throat> I get this uh, these waste products in my body of like emotion mm -hmm. yeah. and then I have to go meditate and I just kind of like clean out all because because all the thinking it gives me so many it creates so much anxiety that the body is full of all these fear chemicals or whatever it almost becomes polluted with all this stuff mm. and then when I go back and meditate it's like I almost feel that it's or I I know that it's the body's cleaning out all this emotional residue yeah. s and sometimes it releases stress from tension and do you do you experience something like that as well? Yeah, yeah, I I, I definitely experience that it um, it affects my yeah ner nervous system in that way. Yeah, and oh, uh, yeah. it's interesting, right? Because I would consider myself like a pretty uh, calm person in general. Yeah, and the thing is, when I'm not meditating, it's like people perceive me still as a calm person from the outside. Yeah. But on the inside, there's a lot of like yeah stress, a lot of turmoil, turmoil, got yeah chaos you could say. And um, meditation just keeps me uh, keeps me balanced, keeps me in, in 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 alignment with my myself, and just kind of, like kind of like you said it, it when you, when I do uh, uh, in that kind of stressful state or in that anxious kind of thoughts <laughs> and things like that. Bless you. Yeah. It um. It really helps regulate that and helps kind of release some of that stuff, which is really interesting, right? Because like you wonder, like how how does it do? How does how does that happen? Is it because we're connecting to our true self or the the source of things, or what what is it that's kind of like releasing that? Do you have an answer for that? David? It's something I've wondered about for a long time. Uh, one thing that's interesting is also I've I still have a lot of tension in my body, but from when I was young, I I aggregated a lot of tension in my muscles, especially around my back and my neck and stuff. And when I started to meditate, I could feel my attention or my awareness go into those muscles and relax them. Mm. And that's when I realized that awareness has a very physical reality to it, because my tense muscles 
were relaxed just by sitting and being aware. Aware of the muscles. Just paying attention to the fact that it was tense. Yeah. And there was a, Is enough for a famous uh, Australian uh, spiritual master called Barry Long who said that inner tension is in attention. So the inner tension comes because we have a lack of attention in our bodies. Mm. And so when we become aware of it, it, it releases. So I, I, uh, I mean, attention, awareness can, it can release trauma, it can release emotions. Most people know that you can sit with it. But the fact that it can, you can give yourself a mental massage and you can go deeper than a massage therapist can if you sit with your tensions and they'll start to release. That shows you how like concrete and physical the interaction between the physical and awareness is. It actually, it concretely goes in and affects physical matter, which muscles are. And what it also does is if I'm, if you have an emotion and you're aware of it, then that, that dissolves the emotion over time. But if say, say if I've been anxious, I've had a panic attack or whatever for, for, for the reason, then what I'll do, if, I, if I've had a scare because something happened or whatever, what I'll do is I'll sit down, I'll, I'll meditate, I'll get into my body, I'll feel the, the sort of the residue from all the fear and all the, the thoughts have stirred up chemicals, maybe my heart is beating, all kinds of things are going on. And the awareness will just make everything relax and it'll just release everything. And afterwards my body, the chemicals are gone from my body. Because I can, I can feel like, you know, you're like, you can feel your body is kind of full of, there's like, you're kind of stretched out, anxious, you've been overloaded, whatever. Mm. And then you sip with it and then it goes away. And similarly, and this is not all, always possible, it has to be very deep meditation, but similarly, there's a certain kind of fatigue in your head or your brain where you feel like you can't think or whatever. And sometimes if you take a nap, that'll go away. But also if you meditate, if it's the, the light kind, if you meditate, you can feel that there is a substance in your brain that is being removed. I'm not entirely sure what it is, but it's your muscles can get like lactic acid, which builds up and then it's a waste product of using your muscles and then the acid builds up and then you can't really use a muscle because the acid is, uh, needs to be removed for the body, for the muscle to work again. Yeah. The brain has similar things. If the brain has been overused for whatever reason, there is waste products in the brain. I don't know the technicality behind it, but I can feel it. And when you meditate, and it's certain, if it's very bad, then you have to have meditation that is so deep that you almost go into sleep mode, which is a very deep kind of meditation. But most of the time, just sitting will reduce that brain fatigue, brain tiredness. Sitting with awareness. Well, awareness is sort of something that's always there. So Yeah, but connecting to that. Yeah, yeah, in a sense. So, so awareness has a very, very, very physical... Uh, reaction to the to the body and I'm not sure what it is but and it's the same with pain disease there sometimes awareness can do something sometimes it doesn't do anything like you if you have the flu you're probably gonna have the flu anyway but there are things that it can definitely do uh, one thing I used to do is if I burnt my finger so what the mind will do if you burn something is the mind will tell you don't go into the pain go away from it mm. So people will sort of do like, they will be like, I don't want to go into the pain. I don't want to be into the pain. And what happens is if you do that, you'll get a blister and you'll get pain for a long time. But if when you burn yourself, you go into the pain straight away, instead of running away from it and you just go into it and you try to relax whatever's going on, then you will likely get much less of a blister or whatever. It will have less pain. It will be, it will be cured faster because when you, when you tense it up and try to escape from it, um, some kind of process is not working as well. Mm. So if I was gonna, if I was gonna say what my intuitive um, theory on this is, is that there are, the body has its own kind of nano machines, and when you and when you put awareness into parts of your body, that sends some kind of thing in that starts working on it, and it could be the immune system. I don't know what it is exactly. In, in uh, China, in Chinese, um, in Qigong, uh, they say that, uh, that energy follows 
the mind. And what they mean is that if you focus on your hand long enough, your hand is going to start uh, feeling, it's going to start getting hot, it's going to get warm. And you're going to start feeling energy in your hands. And you can do that anywhere. In China, they use it to um, heal um, certain things through like acupuncture and they use it in martial arts to like strike harder and stuff. But basically they say the mind leads, the, the spirit or the mind leads energy. Um, so wherever you put your attention, that affects your body somehow. <clears throat> and everyone can kind of uh, experience it right now. If you're sitting on the floor or whatever, if you feel, if you feel how your feet are connected to the floor, feel the your feet touch the floor and now from that go into your feet and see if you can feel it's almost like a vibration inside your feet your feet are vibrating they're alive somehow and if you have pain here you might not want to go into them the mind might be saying oh i don't want to try to open up to the pain and accept it and you'll feel that your feet are vibrating they're full of life there is some kind of energy there. And when you do that, you're actually bringing energy into your feet and that can have healing properties. And it also, it's also a very interesting thing because when you have a wound or you have a pain, what happens? What is pain? Why do we have pain as humans, right? Well, two things. First of all, it's calling attention that something might be wrong. That's the first thing. But the other thing is it calls your mind to the area so your mind starts focusing on the area and that leads energy to the area and that's kind of interesting that also leads healing if you allow yourself to go to that place exactly exactly and you use this you know metaphor before where you talked about where you talked about the feet then you also talked about when you have a cut on your finger you can right. also look at this um this pain or this cut to be an emotion in your body yeah wherever that is whatever that looks like it could be a trauma, it could be a, uh, an emotion that's just stuck there from years ago. But oh, it, yeah. when we're able to use the same thing that you're talking about with the finger, with that emotion, yeah, that can have a huge uh, cleansing or releasing kind of effect on that. Yeah. That, 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 that thing when we're also in meditation or just in, in general when we put our awareness to, to that thing and give that space and actually go into that. Yeah. fully go into it without any avoidance of it at all but just open up to that completely that also kind of gives gives the um, gives your your body or awareness yeah, like uh, puts the awareness into that part of your body and, and, and allows that to kind of um, be free of, of that that blockage or that emotion yeah Which meditation, you know, also helps with, right? Kind of going into those areas or being like sensing your body in, in that way, the subtleties of what's actually happening in your body, like listening to what's going on or a thought or a feeling. And, yeah. Yeah. Trauma release and, and body work is extremely important. And it can be very difficult to get into your body in the beginning. It was very difficult for me. It took, took years. It took years? It took years for me to really embody my body. What do you mean by embody your body? Was... Well, I feel my body from the inside nowadays. Can you, so talk, I don't... you talk us through that? Huh? Can you talk us through that? I'm always keeping uh, some attention to my body to see how my body is doing. And I routinely, intuitively just scan like, okay, how's everything? Check just in. like, just like root, feeling the body from the inside out. And so if you do this root and you inside out and you notice there's something, I don't know, in your chest or in your stomach, or whatever, yeah. then what do you, how do you interact with that? Well, usually if it's uh, 
if it's emotional, then I, you know, I, I have to I usually sit with it or go for a walk. Often I go for a walk. When I was younger, my trauma was very, very strong, very violent. So I could sit down, it would all come up. Mm. As I got older, it was, I needed to go for a walk to loosen it up somehow. So I would go for, because it was, it wasn't as a, like volatile anymore. So I went for a walk and that kind of loosened it up and I would, I would feel it. And other than that, if I feel like, if I, if I feel something weird going on in my body, I, I, that isn't emotional. What I do is I feel the thing and I ask myself, I ask my intuition, I say, is this dangerous? Should I get this checked out? Is this, mm. this is a dangerous thing? And then my body, you know, usually almost always says no, because most of all, it's not dangerous. Yeah. And then I say, okay, it's not dangerous. And then <clears throat> it's gone within a week or whatever. So you literally just ask your intuition. I ask my intuition and I see what f sometimes an answer comes, but otherwise a feeling will come. I will, I will know, mm. a feeling will tell me, I will just know intuitively. Like if I drink a glass of water, I'll know whether that water is hot or cold. The same way when I ask myself, I'll know is this dangerous or not. I just know. Mm. And everyone has that intelligence. How often do we ask ourselves that in, in general? Like, I mean, you, you and I do that, right? Right. And I've been doing that much more like the last months or something. But how often do we actually just ask our intuition, is this like, is this dangerous or not? Or what, or like, what does this, you know, or just, just ask the intuition things. Mm. I'm not sure if that's such a common practice. <laughs> no, people, people ask their mind. It's actually an interesting thing because you said something This is, this is always a fascinating thing for me because now I don't know where I'm going with this, but I hope my mind knows where it's going with this. So Your mind or your intuition? Yeah, right now I have, I have a quarter of an idea. I don't know where it ends. I've forgotten what it was about. I have no idea what's going on, but we'll see if we end up there anyway. See, this is very interesting. It's a, it's a, and now that I've talked away from it, I'm even further from it. I can't remember it at all. But let's see if, this, let's see if the intuition, let's see if not knowing is enough. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so interesting. So, you talked about how we should go into the emotion if we have like a difficult emotion or trauma, or whatever. And and you said go into the emotion, open up to, into the emotion. And you were you were right. That's a good technique. But here's the interesting thing when you cut yourself it, it's painful and the attention calls it calls your attention to the finger mm. and if you're if you're uh, still a fool then you go away from pain and if you become wise then you go into pain right that's pretty much it and so you go into the pain you open up to it you suffer whatever pain it is and this this helps the body heal because the body does not it doesn't help the body when you try to contract when you tr contract and create tension and want to get away yeah. That doesn't make anything heal, that creates a blockage mm. and suddenly you got a bad wound or whatever. So the question is then, if we have trauma, why doesn't the body automatically heal that? Why doesn't the body automatically take our attention into the trauma and automatically dissolve it? And here's the fascinating thing, it does. It does. Now you said you should take your attention into it, open up to it, and, all that, and that's correct. Most people start that way, and that's absolutely what I did as well. But here's the thing. Why is it that all trauma is not self-healing? What happens? And that's what's so fascinating is, what do we do when it hurts? We start thinking to try and get away from it. Or rather, our mind tries to stop us from going into the pain by continuously sending thoughts up and trying to distract us. So our body has a trauma, we have an emotion, some strong emotion, and it calls us to it. But then the mind says, I don't want to feel this, I don't want to feel mm. this. Think about it, do something else, uh, distract, distract yourself, yourself yeah. find, you need to find love, this is actually something else, uh, call someone, whatever. The mind says, I'll do, I'll do whatever you want me to, just don't, I don't want to go into this feeling. Yeah, because, the, because the mind is foolish. So the mind believes that happiness comes from avoiding pain. That's what the, mind, the, the ego believes. The ego believes that happiness comes from chasing pleasure and avoiding pain. 
And of course, anyone who chases pleasure and avoids pain finds pain and avoids pleasure. That's how it always goes. So it's so fascinating that that once you learn to to let your leave your thoughts alone, you'll actually your body will naturally call upon your attention. You will become aware of the traumatic feelings you'll go into them and they'll dissolve and you won't have to use an iota of effort you won't have to direct your attention at all because your awareness is already your awareness is already doing it yeah. the only reason why the process is interrupted is because the mind yeah. and it's the same mind that says don't feel the finger that's hurting don't go into your everyone who's had a cramp knows what happens if you try to get away from the cramp and it gets 10 times worse yeah, if you want to avoid a cramp, you must consciously calm yourself down, go into it, slowly stretch out your leg or whatever it is, bear the pain and then let it relax. Mm. It's extremely difficult because the mind just wants to get out of it. But you, if you are wise, then you, that's what you have to do. Yeah. And it's, that, it's like that with everything. So it's, it's just a fascinating thing that trauma is self... If you look at a dog or a, any animal you'll see that they naturally self-heal trauma. Because... Us as human beings don't. We get yeah. so caught up in our minds right. about the trauma and it's so strong, that pain, and every time it comes up, we're just like, our minds are like, we can't have that in our life. Yeah. And I don't so want we, this. I don't want this, yeah. Every other animal knows how to do it, but we have a, a mind. And that's, and, and we talked about meditation um, before, and that's also, I mean, the, the, the two parts are the same thing, really. Right. Because the meditation really goes into this awareness, like, what well, speaks right to the awareness and able to notice what your mind is doing. Right. Or when it is kind of caught up in... Um, not wanting the pain or not wanting the, the trauma. Yeah. And so what meditation really allows us to do is kind of go do, do, the, do the opposite of that, understand our mind and our ego and uh, understand when it, like notice when it's coming up and notice when there is emotions there that kind of, in, to allow that, allow them to be there. I just butted in in your. Hmm? <laughs> oh, you're you're right. There was much to nothing to add there. And isn't that incredible though that our awareness, when we allow ourselves to. Uh, for our awareness to kind of heal those, the wound, the trauma, the emotion, the the pain. Like you said, it doesn't require any effort. It requires the effort of to to get the to um, for our, our mind not to interfere with that. Mm. But not actually the healing itself. Right. And that's you know what I notice is like some of the most powerful. Um, powerful but like some of the most moving times in the therapy and stuff in the therapy room is when those emotional blockages or that trauma is is given space given room to just actually breathe and be there oh yeah and to just kind of and that that's a it's incredibly freeing for that person incredibly just like like this weight off the shoulders or this kind of like just like something dissolving within them yeah like a stone falls from your heart we say in danish a and stone falls from your heart and that's really how it is there's an <laughs> alleviation yeah
So what would you say to somebody who's not familiar with meditation or has some kind of preconceived idea about what it needs to look like or be like or whatever? What would you kind of... If they wanted to get started today, how would you... How would you guide them to it? I would say that... I guess I would... Uh, <laughs> I would ask you that question, Jonathan. No, Tobin. <laughs> no. While I steal the last tea here. You want, you should... I'll, get, I'll give you some first, because otherwise I'm going to take all of it. <laughs> you want to do tea Let me fill whilst up, we're doing this podcast? Fill here. up your cup. Hey, a cup of tea has always been tradition and every enlightenment tradition. That is the meditation. They used it to stay awake. And also, the great benefit of tea is that you have to boil the water. And you did that in times where the water was often dirty, full of bacteria. So they would drink tea instead of water in many places. <clears throat> Wait, so you just put the question back onto me, Tobin? Is it the well, I didn't do it, but uh, did. Okay. The man upstairs. I would say just say, first of all, like, to whatever it is in your life, whether it's meditation, whether it's um, being with that person that you, you love or, you know, the type, kind of work you do or whatever it is, it's important to choose that. So if it's meditation in this case, then the first thing is actually just choosing that I actually... Yeah, choose meditation and choose to show up for it. Because that's, I mean, part of the thing is like the discipline in it. Because you know, anything in life takes something of you. Yeah. Right? And so it's not going to happen if you just uh, a little bit like loose with it. It's going to happen if you actually say, okay, there's no excuses here. I'm just going to sit down and, and do it, do the work. And the work is on, on yourself. The work is on your, on your, on your growth and your understanding of who, who you are and your, your, your awareness, your, your thoughts, your minds, your emotions, your body. And I mean, like, and that, that ripples into all areas of your life. Oh, so yeah. is that not one of the highest, like, or, or is that not an, an, an important enough thing to kind of, put some time away in your day for however busy your day is because that time can also be the most peaceful the most connected the most calm the most kind of connecting part like time time in that day and this and this is what i'm talking about now is like kind of sitting down in a bit more like a formal meditation because you can also just meditate when you're with people you do that all the time with me too yeah we do that together as well but if you're just starting out, if you're just kind of getting started on this, then just sitting there, sitting there with your, whether you're in a chair or finding a place in your home where you choose to just sit down and give your time, give yourself that time of the day um, to meditate. Personally, I actually just have this um, space in my lounge room where every morning I wake up and the very first thing I do is just go down stairs and sit there for you know sometimes 10 minutes sometimes 20 minutes just depends on the day but just some time whatever that is for you that could be just starting out with five minutes or whatever that looks like and just sitting there and you know essentially just noticing your your mind noticing or observing your thoughts and observing what's going on in your body and allowing that awareness to kind of be there and just notice that as well. So whatever comes up in that time, just just notice, notice that. I mean, we're sitting here 
doing a meditation before and I, I said to you, Torbjörn, um, would you be like willing to give an instruction? And what was the instruction that you gave the whole time we're meditating? I said, uh, observe that. And then I didn't say anything more. <laughs> and that is at, at the at the core of meditation, right? It's the simplicity of, <laughs> I mean, there's much more to it than that. Um, but that's a starting point, right? And so coming back to the meditation uh, practice, just sitting there with yourself, you know, five, 10 minutes a day can be longer, can be shorter, whatever suits you in the beginning. But just putting that time on the way because that's your own time, your own growth, your own, it's working on, you, on yourself and your understanding of self and giving your awareness some space to kind of, yeah, be there and notice that part of you that sometimes, you know, we're so busy just in our day-to-day -day life that we're, we're not even aware of what is going on inside ourself. And, and so... We're not even yeah. aware that we're not aware yeah. Yeah. Not even aware that we're not aware. Yeah, we're just kind of running, right? We're just doing one thing after the other, reacting from our thoughts, thought after thought. Whatever it says, we just kind of do that blindly until you get to a point, and maybe it's from meditation, maybe it's from reflection on your life, maybe it's that you just, you know, become aware somehow when you start noticing hey hang on a second like there's there's these thoughts and I don't have to react from them I can kind of step back from them or get a higher perspective of that and notice them coming and going and I can just choose to do something something different to that when you do realize that when you do become aware of that 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 is a very very significant day in your life oh yes very, very big. The realization that we are not our thoughts. The realization that we are something more than our thoughts. We're more than the feelings that we have. There's something else going on. The day you see your, your thoughts for the first time, that's your first awakening. Mm. And whether you like it or not, from that day on, you're on, you're on the spiritual path. <laughs> and if you try to avoid it, then you will suffer extremely until you start to embrace it and that might not seem very fun but as you start to embrace it you find out that the gift you've been given is so unfathomably great that you would have accepted it no matter what anyway but the hero always has to refuse the call that's part of every story when the call comes to the hero the hero says no. In the beginning. In the beginning. The hero never asks for the call. It's thrust upon them. And so they say no. And maybe listening to this conversation, listening to this, uh, us talk about meditation, you might have, your mind might say many different things about it. And it might put its art like kind of scream to say, you know, this isn't for you. This isn't right for you. Or I've, I've done meditation before and it doesn't doesn't suit me or doesn't fit me. Well, actually, you know, we're human beings and we and meditation can fit everyone. It's just depending on, you know, how you do it as a as and what works for you as a person, right? Um, where was I going with that? And there's and a lot of people who have trauma may find meditation to be painful or unpleasant because they'll be mm. going into silence. Yeah. And this can be, this is where I was going with it. So for your, for, for your mind or your ego, this can be completely uh, like a no go. This, this, Cause this is like a, uh, how would you say that to him? Death. <laughs> an ego death yeah 
Your ego knows that meditation is death. For the ego. Yeah. For the mind. Because it's liberation from that part of yourself. From your thoughts. And therefore it looks at it like an enemy. And it is. From the ego's perspective, it is the enemy. And the only way you would know what this is like is if you actually take the time to sit down and experience this, to notice what's going on within yourself. And I would, I would qualify, um, if you have some kind of diagnosis, if you have some kind of disorder, whatever, you might really not want to sit down or be still or whatever. And start by doing movement meditation. Start doing, you can learn Tai Chi, Qigong, you can learn some kind of thing, but you can also just stand in your room, move around in circles, sway, do whatever you want to do, mm. and then meditate through movement. Because some, some people's nervous system is so, so erratic and so stressed out that sitting still may just be impossible at the beginning but you can you can sway you can move you can rock you can do whatever it is you want to do as long as you pay attention to what it feels like while you're doing it uh, while you're f thinking and feeling while you're doing it anything could be meditation the quality of meditation simply means that you are paying attention to what's going on inside you so if sitting is completely no go for you you can find other ways to do it you could even go for a run and do it but it's probably best if you're somewhere undisturbed where you can be on your own and then you can move around if that helps you because it's much easier to notice what's going on within yourself when you when you're in a, a space where it's there is less distractions at least in the beginning yeah. And if this is something you find uh, like confused about, or like where do I go with this, or how do I get some more kind of like guidance with this, then Tobian is the person to come to. <laughs> yeah, or, or Jonathan. Both of us. <laughs> or Jonathan, you can yeah. can reach out to us. You can you can always you can Google it. Yeah. You can uh, look up resources. But you know, it's, it is different Googling something, YouTubing something to actually being with somebody in in person or like, you know, somebody giving you that instruction like that's actually in real time. At least from my experience, it, that's that's been, there's it's a different quality around that. How do you feel about that too? Yeah, I think it's very different and I think the person's energy is also going to ignite your energy. Yeah. Um, so it's it's going to it's going to kindle the the flame of consciousness in you as well, because mm. consciousness is is energy; it can be transferred. It's like when we're when you, you and talk I talk about that, don't you? The transference of yeah, we we talked about that in an early episode. But like for example, you and I meditate uh, together. Like that meditation is much more does much more quality in that than when I meditate alone. Really. Oh, definitely, because there's more energy available. Mm. Um, so it's much clearer for longer. So it's also a fascinating thing how, you know, spirituality, awareness, everything is just better with others, really, if you can find other people, meditate with other people, meet up with other people, have a group, whatever. Mm. Good companions are a serious recommendation of the ancients. Well, I'm grateful that you're my companion to learn right now. <laughs> and that we did, like we do meditate and meet up in person like this. It's, it's, uh, it definitely lifts my, my, my consciousness, you could say. It lifts kind of like the awareness um, within me. So it's, uh, yeah, definitely notice that. That's what, something I, I want to touch on as well, is that uh, I, I, we talked about this earlier, but this is something that, this is kind of a key thing in my life, which I want to share is that I didn't believe I could find someone like you, but because it's very hard to find 
spiritual people who are on my level and can reflect kind of what I do. I can find a lot of people that want to have that want to get help from me, but it's very hard to find people who can reflect things back to me and help me. So I was I wasn't sure I could find anyone like you. Um but I I opened myself up to it. I wanted it to happen and then I did the things that I felt like doing when it was when I felt like doing them. And then we met and when I met you I was and still am extremely surprised about how, you know, the how spiritual you are, how you know sensitive you are, how ethical you are, like I didn't know there were people of this quality like so close to me. I had no idea. But and th that's the key takeaway I want to say is that I didn't know it was possible, but I asked for it anyway. I said to the universe, this is what I would like. And then I opened myself up to to mm. doing whatever in my in my case it was like I saw your post on LinkedIn one day and I was like, "Hey, should we do a collab?" And that that was a spontaneous action for me. And at the time I was like, I didn't really know you. I didn't know these things about you. It was just kind of a feeling, so I just went with it. Yeah. And we ended up connecting up, and it was very random, really. But that's interesting in itself, that there was a feeling that came up, a spontaneous kind of thing, and you trusted in that. Mm. Intuitively, just kind of like, okay, that's this is coming up to myself, I'm going to trust in that and just go with it, not knowing yeah. what will happen, and here we are. You know, create, like we're, we're doing this podcast, and we're talking about a lot of exciting things in the future that's kind of coming up with, oh, yeah. with us as a... Um, yeah, as with 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 what we're creating right now, and uh, and that's you know the, the the most incredible thing about our intuition and awareness and stuff when we're able to just connect to that and and then come from that place, there can be incredible things that come out of that. Yeah, and things that are like on our really on our path on our like uh, in aligns with what's important to us and like you said yourself you know you were open for that and and that was around the time where i was as well and i i honestly would say like at that time i was like man do spiritual people even <laughs> live in denmark and stuff yeah, I and since i asked that. that question like and opened myself to that there's been a lot of incredible spiritual and just loving people that have entered my life and i'm i'm really grateful for that and and also asking for that yeah. Um, because that was something that was definitely missing uh, when I first moved to Denmark. And um, yeah. And I really, I really want to emphasize that point that you don't have to believe something is possible. You just have to ask for it and open up for it. Yeah. Because your ego, my ego has always, I come from a family where nothing is possible, right? So <laughs> that's how my ego was programmed. So I'm saying you don't have to believe you just have to open up to it and then see with your own eyes. And something I talked about you earlier, something that also helps me is I remind myself that it's not my job to figure out how to get things done. Mm. I'm not supposed to know how I'm going to achieve my dreams. My job is to figure out what is it that I want to do and how do I want to do it. So I follow my, my energy, my desire, what makes me happy. And then it's up to the universe to make to manifest uh, whatever path that leads to for me. I don't need to know how I get to my goal or my dream. That's not my job. That's not what the human mind does. That's what the universe does. The human mind is made to seek and follow your bliss. That's your job. Now, how that gets you to where you need to be, that's the universe's job. And you have to respect that division because if you start trying to think your way or force your way towards your dream, you will suffer incredibly and you, will make, and you will make other people suffer. Now, if spontaneously you get up, you, you, you know what the plan is, whatever, that's different. That's fine. You follow, your, you follow mm. the good energy. But, but you force it. You might, some people get a calling, they get a vision, they know exactly what to do. Some people get nothing. They just walk the pathless path and they get there anyway. So it's very different from people. But the important part is that the human mind is not made to understand the universe. It is just made to follow the, the human energy. And creation happens on its own from there. 
the, the human mind is, is made to trust, it's not made to doubt and to figure out. And if you should be one of those people who have a lot of energy and you're very disciplined and you work your way to your goal, remember that every brick of this universe that you force out of position through your sheer effort is going to shift back into place at some point because you're going against the will of heaven, the will of everything by trying to force things and that will come back. And the only way you can stop it from coming back is to continuously apply effort. So if you get your business or dream together through effort, then that dream will require effort here from and until the day that you give up on it. Because it is through effort that it will be sustained because it's through effort that you created it. But if you don't create it through effort, if you create it through energy, through spontaneity, through desire and through joy, and all those things come by themselves, by the way, they, you don't create those. If you create it through something that comes by itself, then it stays by itself. And you're following the will of heaven. You are, strictly speaking, working with what the universe wants to happen. And therefore everything will naturally come into the right place. So whoever tells you that you have to work, fight, and force your way through life, you can do that. But there will be consequences. Mm. And this way that you're talking about is a different path. The path of trust. Indeed. The path of energy, the path of the, the royal path, not the path of the warrior or the soldier. There are there is an old parable of two men. They each want to get to an island, and the first one he goes into a rowboat. And he rows all the way with sheer effort and discipline, he rows all the way to the island. And he arrives, takes him a week to get to the island. And another man, he makes himself a sailboat. He has no oars or anything, he just has a sail. And when he goes to sail, sometimes the wind blows and then he puts up the sails. Sometimes the wind doesn't blow and then he relaxes in his boat. And 10 days later, he arrives at the same island. And when he arrives, the man in the rowboat laughs at him and, see, and says, see how slow you were, see how long it took you to get here. I've been here for three days, you've just arrived. And the man in the rowboat thought he'd won because he got there three days earlier. But you have to consider, how do you want to live? Do you want to get there three days earlier and force and fight yourself through every obstacle? Or do you want to put up the sail when the energy is there and relax when it isn't there? And you get to choose and life will give you the life that you want. And I know which one that I've chosen. So, it's up to you. That's really beautiful. I think that's it for Conversations in the Earth. Episode tonight. four. <laughs> no five. Thanks for listening in, being a part of this conversation around meditation and we hope that uh this has given you some kind of new insight and new way of looking at it looking at this path and your path and what you choose to do, how you choose to live it, how you choose to show up and work on yourself and your, your truth. And we're always here for you and we, we only want you to, to, to succeed, to achieve that, to be on that path and be close to your awareness, to know yourself. And that's it for me. It for me too. See you on the trail, camper. <laughs>